The political environment that would later be manufactured across the nation of France was first. The political environment that would later be manufactured across the nation of France was first. Oh my fucking god! How am I getting this wrong? How am I? How am I getting the political environment that would later be manufactured across the nation of France was first crafted, developed during its time as an absolute monarchy. The monarch or state was traditionally conservative. Christian fundamentalist, and upholding of the feudal economic system. Liberal critics of the French state got organized one day, beginning the French Revolution, where power was seized, the king and queen overthrown, and a representative democracy instated. This was triggered by pre-existent history, for the many revolutionary outbreaks across Europe and France by the proletariat, who had waged war against capitalism. Karl Marx wrote two books on the subject, The Civil War in France, and the class struggles in France, 1848 to 1850. These conflict, which Marx wrote upon, occurred later on in France's history, and were the result of pent-up proletarian rage against the bourgeois statism of the country. France was once sick of its conservative, monarchist status, and was then sickened by the capitalistic liberalism which had engulfed it. The Paris Commune, a space in Paris run by anarchists and libertarian socialists, was the creation of anarchic and Marxist-minded workers who were fed up with being treated abysmally by their employers. They got together and held together a stateless, decentralized zone within the capital Paris, but unfortunately, they were rather soonly dismantled by the French state's police force. Marx went on to praise the efforts of the socialists who had made this reality, where all firms were owned and managed by the workers point to this event as an historical step for the possible later achievements of socialism. Eventually, the Third French Republic was formed, lasting from 1870 to 1940, headed by a variety of presidents, which continued the capitalist, liberal, representatively democratic essence of France's recent past. And although monarchy had long ended, in the grand scheme of things it was, in relative terms, extremely recent. The sheer quantity of progress France had been seeing lately was astounding, as all of Europe appeared to be following in the political systematic footsteps. And liberalism wasn't just a systematic phenomenon, it was a cultural one too. The ontology of materialism, the concept of natural rights, the secular separation of church and state, the spirit of individualism, all these ideas and principles were becoming widely favored by the French and more generally European people. In 1940, however, the Third French Republic was no more, becoming the Vichy regime, France now being headed by the Nazi Germany collaborator Philippe Pertain, who was a far-right nationalist who had destroyed the nation's representative democracy in favor of his dictatorships. Dictatorship. France's old motto, liberty, equality, fraternity, it was now replaced with work, family, fatherland. This nationalist state, which was partnered with Hitler's Germany, was anti-communist, anti-democratic, and always utterly opposed all liberal doctrines in culture and politics. The Satan famously murdered Spanish anarchists, anti-fascist activists, and heaps of Jewish people, having adopted the anti-Semitic perspective inherent to National Socialism. Of course, as we all know, since the state no longer exists, it fell apart in 1944. When World War II ceased, everything appeared to go back to the way it used to be, back to liberal democracy, liberal culture, and Enlightenment-inspired social ethics and standards. During the Third French Republic, prior to the establishment of the Vichy regime, there were certain philosophers and writers whose beliefs had predated that of fascism, who were delighted to see their state overtaken by a genuinely nationalistic entity. There were many writers, many philosophers, many social critics of the French liberal democratic state who could be mentioned and discussed here. However, so that this video doesn't go on forever and to more or less simply provide a clear overview of the fort, which subsisted at the time, I'll choose three primary proto-fascist thinkers to talk about, to layer upon their beliefs in activism. These three are Charles Maurice, Maurice Bars, and Georges Sorel. We we'll begin with Maurice. Charles Maurice was the founder of the political ideology known as Integral Nationalism, along with being the most prominent member of Action Francis. As the term integral implies, this was as much a form of nationalism as it was in addition to the Catholic faith. Maurice was a Roman Catholic and permitted his religious views to influence his sense of patriotism and nationality. That being French was a spiritual experience, the state of being French, 
something incorporeal, socially woven. France had historically been a Catholic state, not anymore but at the time. So Marie's wanted it to stay this way, where religion was incorporated into everyday life and everyday social behaviours and ethics. Integral nationalism had four primary characteristics, which define it to help it stand out from other variants of nationalism. One, the belief in the necessity of absolute monarchy. There is to be a king and a queen, and they ought to govern without constitutional restraint upon their power. Marie's believed that democracy was a logical fallacy. Why? Because it, from view, falls under the appeal to majority fallacy. Just because the majority of people believe something to be right, doesn't make it so. If most people agree to worsening their lives, letting them do so is not only a cruelty inflicted upon them, but a cruelty inflicted upon all the non-consenting individuals they've roped into their mess. For monarchy to work, one man must be wise. For democracy to work, a majority of the people must be wise. Which is more likely? Two, the belief in the Catholic Church is interchangeable to the state. The Church follows the most fundamental of Catholic laws and upholds such principles through the utilization of the monarchist government. The rules set forth by Christianity, which all individuals must follow, aren't negotiable from the confines of Maurice's ideal France. And three, the exclusion of all non-culturally French people, which has no connection with ethnicity. Integral nationalism is a kind of civic nationalism which rests upon the belief that while everyone needs to share the same culture, religious faith, social norms and morality, in order to remain within the same territorial confines together, not everyone has to be of the same ethnicity or race. Rejecting what was quite popular at the time, the ethno-nationalism of Adolf Hitler, Marie's believed that people should be spiritually not physically connected, and that genetic distances play no role in shaping positive social environments as long as everyone was ideologically homogenous. Despite sharing many traits with fascism, the belief in divine authority, the belief in hierarchy in the family, the need for a spiritual faith to unite all people within a pencil-scratched nest created by our minds, Marie's subscribed to monarchism and not traditional fascist absolutism, and also endorsed metaphysical positivism. Yes, positivism, admiring the work of Auguste Kant, one of the main positivist theorists, this is entirely at odds with fascism, with Giovanni Gentile and every fascist intellectual who spoke on positivism being fully opposed to it. Still though, Marie's interactions with fellow fascist intellectuals earned him correctly a seat in the history of pre-Mussolini fascism. The general worldview and attitude he held, his spirit, was absolutely akin to fascist politics. Maurice Baz was a fiction author and journalist who lived throughout the Third French Republic, whose views on the nation predated how fascism saw it. Like Giovanni Gentile and Frederick Hegel, Maurice Baz saw the nation as something created by the consciousness of its citizens, that it was a product of their personality and will. Baz held that the nation was beyond anything anyone could manage themselves, that it wasn't the spirit of any single Frenchman, but the entirety of the nation's population. But this state was interchangeable, a synonym for its people. Because Boz was a fiction writer who wrote romanticized tales inspired by classical French literature and identity, he saw France as a story actively being written by those who resided within its sphere. His gravitation toward writing fiction was actually derived from his nationalist politics. He had stated, The reader collaborates with the author in every book. Or, alternatively phrased, phrased The reader is co-author in every book. In other words, the reader is just as much creating the work as the author, since all things are created by multiple consciousnesses. This, of course, explains another statement he made. The individual is nothing. Society is everything. The only time the French people were separate from the politicians who ruled over them, according to the ideology of Maurice Baz, was when such politicians did something un-French, where in liberal fashion they disrespected the traditions and customs that had historically been present in France. Boz took his nationalism to the next level when he supported the massacre of religious Jews by French reactionaries because he didn't consider them to be truly French. When a bunch of Jewish French citizens had been illegally assassinated, Maurice Boz had this strange dream on the night of the massacre, or a few nights after, where he awoke to be confronted with a giant ocean somewhere in his country, with rippling tides and a blue sky above his head. He claimed his voice spoke to him, I presume in the French language. It was his nation telling him that his existence 
and the existence of any single French subject was but an almost meaningless, mere grain of sand in a vast beach of history. Balls rejected the liberal and democratic view that the nation was the expression of the rational interests of individual male inhabitants of France. For him, the nation emanated from a spiritual feeling beyond normal human understanding, a view shaped by the trendy psychological ideas about the collective human unconscious and by the literary symbolist movement, which believed that art could act as the hidden myths underlying human behavior. Balls saw the nation as the product of history, tradition, and of the long contact of the French peasantry with the national soil. His book, The Undying Spirit of France, detailed France as a spiritual organism, that which was the heart, blood, and soul of those who inhabited it, were those who inhabited it. Bars was a close companion to Charles Maurice, as they both worked together as activists to advance the interests of the French nation-state at the expense of its liberal, cosmopolitan, and Marxist adversaries. They wrote in the same journals together, and would frequently exchange dialogue on how Action Francis should present itself to the public to get people on board with counter-revolutionary concepts as the nation was all his reality was. It's unsurprising, he'd say. There is no reality for me but pure thought. Minds alone are interesting. There was another person who joined Action Francis who's incredibly relevant to the subject. I'm, of course, referring to Georges Sorel. Georges Eugene Sorel identified as a Marxist throughout the first portion of his literary career, which garnered him attention from members of Action Francis and many socialists across the Third French Republic. In reality, he was actually an anarcho syndicalist who misused the Marxist label because Marxism just happened to be the far more prevalent proletarian tendency of the time, and, well, today as well. He had knowledge that plenty of anarchists were present within the broad syndicalist movement and would often show up to cynicalist meetings and lectures. Sorel's economic orientation was that of cynicalism and libertarian socialism. In retrospect, he's often referred to as a libertarian Marxist or Marxist cynicalist, similar to the American revolutionary cynicalist and libertarian Marxist Daniel de Leon. The only difference between their versions of socialism was that Daniel de Leon was generally opposed to anarchism and in favor of a withering way state, correctly labeling himself a Marxist while Sorel was in favor of a swift abolition of the state. Sorel was many things other than a proponent of socialism, as he was quite notably a theorist of scientific structures, an unlikely critic of realism. He was not a Marxist, despite his claims to be, as he bluntly criticized materialism and every manifestation of it at every opportunity possible, while, Marxist, while, Marxist, blah, 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 while Marxists believed socialism and communism to be the result of historical material arrangements workers would manufacture in reference to the various financial physical environments needing to be collectivized, Sorel believed in the myth, enacted by passionate proletarian violence, which would internally strengthen all workers, something entirely spiritual, only made possible by the minds of the people. Although Sorel's anti-materialism is sprinkled throughout all his works, just as Marx's anti-idealism is, his book, From George Sorel Volume 2, Hermeneutics and the Sciences, highlights his old specific views regarding metaphysics, providing a lengthy critique of realist thought. Social and economic laws are not chains, nor a constricting framework, but guidelines to possible action, generated and developed by and in action. The future is open. Sorel rejects such determinist phraseology as tendencies working with eye and necessity toward inevitable results, and the like of which death's capital is full. Marxism is a doctrine of life good for strong peoples. It reduces ideology to the role of a mere instrument. History, for Sorel, is what it was for Hegel, a journal in which men are authors and actors, Above all, it is a struggle between the forces of vitality and those of decay, activity and passivity, dynamic energy versus cowardice and surrender. Marx's deepest single insight for Sorel is his notion of the class war is the matrix of all social change. Creation is always a struggle. Greek civilization for Sorel is symbolized by the sculptor who cuts the marble. The resistance of the stone, resistance as such, is essential to the process of creation. In modern factories, the struggle is not merely between men, workers, and nature survived raw material, but between workers and employers who seek to extract surplus value by exploiting other men's labor power. In this struggle, men, like steel, are refined. Their courage, their self-respect, their solidarity for each other, grow. Their sense of justice selves too, 
For justice, according to Perdong, to whom Sorel's debt is greater than even to Mox, is something which springs from the feeling of indignation aroused by the humiliation inflicted on others. What is insulted is what is common to all men, their humanity which is ours. The insult to human dignity is felt by the offender, by the injured man, and by the third party, this common protest, which they all feel within them, is the sense of justice and injustice. What Sorel is saying is that we're not mere passive observers of reality, as materialism would hold for human beings in this ontology don't create the universe, but merely observe it, with their observation lifting no weights. Rather, we actively generate and sustain all that which subsists in front of us, that has entered into the sphere of consciousness because it has been imagined by consciousness. Sorel's irrationalist fantasies cause him to praise and idealize the ancient Greeks, in particular ancient Greek warriors who are constant movers of their destinies, not bystanders who had no role to play in shaping and structuring the environments around them. Thus, Sorel criticized determinism, including historical materialism, which led him to, eventually, give up his incorrect title as a Marxist. Without the use of formulas that might seem vague or erroneous to the scientist, men of action would never attain durable results. Unintelligible dogmas provoke heroic acts. It is useless to argue with people who are accustomed to reducing everything to great part principles, which do not evoke a single world image, which reduce their effects automatically without leading to a single act of reflection. These principles seize the imagination with an extraordinary tenacity and sometimes succeed in dominating the mind absolutely. It would be childish to condemn the processes that have their roots in the laws of our minds, but critical thought must never allow the processes of common sense and those of science to become confused. For George Sorrell, it didn't matter whether or not a certain kind of propaganda or moral or general notion, whether a myth in his time or a meme today, was devoid of reason, that is, in itself, if it leads to things external which are of a positive quantity, quality. Ugh. Even if a fabrication, a social construction like the concept of nationalistic mythology, giving people a false identity and inaccurate sense of their supposed past, if, for nationalists, it leads to people behaving in such a way as to uphold the values and borders of their state, nothing else should honestly matter. Sorrell believed that all men possessed he owed to his own unflagging labor. Certainly natural science was a triumph of human effort, but it was not a transcriptional map of nature. As the positivists had claimed in the 18th century, they and their modern disciples were mistaken about this. There were two natures. Artificial nature, the nature of science, a system of idealized entities, atoms, electric charges, mass, energy, and the like, fictions compounded out of observed uniformities, particularly in regions relatively remote from man's daily concerns, like the contents of the world, astrology, deliberately adapted to mathematical treatment that would enable man to identify some of the furniture of the universe, and to predict and, indeed, control parts of it. The concepts and categories in terms of which this nature had been constructed were conditioned by human aims. They abstracted from the universe those aspects that were of interest to men and possessed sufficient regularity to make them capable of generalization. This, of course, was a suspendous achievement, but an achievement of the creative imagination, not an accurate reproduction of the structure of reality, not a map, still less a picture of what there was. Outside this set of formulae of imaginary entities and mathematical relationships, in terms of which the system was constructed, there was natural nature, the real thing, chaotic, terrifying, compounded of ungovernable forces against which man had to struggle, which if he were to survive in Crete, he had at least in part to subdue, with the help indeed of his sciences, but similarity, the coherence, were attributes of the first or artificial nature, the construction of his intellect, something that was not found but made. Relying on atoms or anything deemed mathematical or static, unable to be altered, supposedly was something Sorel utterly despised. In order for truth and reason to derive from science, from particles and physics, such signs would have to be unchangeable, that it is motionless, not shaped by human consciousness and actions. But of course, since Sorel rejected materialism and realism, he didn't believe that atoms existed independent of the mind. Everything related to science was, thus, the social construct we've collectively created, that which bends to our will, since the atoms only reside within our minds. If we pictured them differently, bestowed upon them alternative purposes for their existence, Sorel would argue that such particles would change, sway, and become an entirely new substance. Giovanni Gentile had remarked in reference to the influence Sorel had on him in fascism. It is well known that Sorelian cynicism, out of which the thought and the political method of fascism emerged, conceived itself the genuine interpretation of Marxist communism, the dynamic conception of history, in which force as violence functions as an essential, is of unquestioned Marxist origins. Those notions flowed into other currents of contemporary thought, 
that had themselves, via alternative routes, arrived at a vindication of that form of state, impossible but absolutely rational, that finds historic necessity in the very spiritual dynamicism to which it realizes itself. It was actually George Sorel who had led Benito Mussolini in a different direction when it arrived to his socialist approaches and studies. Originally, Mussolini was an anti-nationalist materialist who had rejected religion and the church, who saw no pride in militarism and imperialism, hence why he originally opposed all war, even if enacted by socialists, going so far as to expel certain members of the Italian Socialist Party for advocating intervention against monarchist states. However, when he began reading Sorel, having finished his book Reflections on Violence, he had shifted his view on certain subjects. Mussolini believed in the spirit now, or was arriving into groups of it, later announcing that orthodox Marxism, with all its anti-nationalist sentiment, was to an extent incorrect, for the proletariat required the nation as its warm home, a place to call its own. When Benito Mussolini was forced to retire from the Italian Socialist Party for publicly supporting intervention against foreign countries, he had identified himself as a Sorelian syndicalist, following the ideas of Sorel to the point of attempting to make them a reality, as he and his comrades joined the battlefield in an attempt to lessen the chaos the First World War was causing. As we know, this wouldn't last, with his endorsement of syndicalism fading away, having been replaced gradually by the more recognized traditional concept of national corporatism. As Gentili wrote, Benito Mussolini had emerged from Italian socialism in 1915 in order to become a more faithful interpreter of the will of the people of Italy, to whom he, already editor of the socialist paper of Adi, which to devote his new journal, don't know how to pronounce the name, sorry about that, he argued for the necessity of the war, for Italy's entry into which he was among those truly responsible. To see he had struggled against masonry while a socialist, inspired by Cerulean cynicalism, he opposed the parliamentary corruption of reformism with the idealistic pursuits of revolution and violence in the name of revolution. Outside the ranks of official socialism, he continued his battle against his old comrades, defending the rationale of the war, defending the infragable moral and economic wholeness of the national organism against the flying fictions of internationalism. He argued for the sanctity of the fatherland, something that would be sacred, even for the working classes. George Sorel, realizing that his beliefs didn't correspond to Marxism and were in fact quite the reverse, was invited by Charles Maurice to join Axis Francis, where he, Maurice, Maurice Bars, would work together to promote French spiritual nationalism. Sorel had adopted integral nationalism as his ideology, espousing the virtues of monarchy and the evils of internationalism. All three of them were civic nationalists who had different economic views which fell outside the typical socialist-slash-capitalist dynamic. None were communists, but their enemy wasn't ever communism. It was metaphysical individualism. Maurice, who had initially hated all socialists of a burning passion, had famously remarked one day, related to that of questioning the modes of the socialists he encountered across the Third Republic. There is opposition, contradiction, between egalitarian and international Marxism and the protection of nation and of fatherland, but a socialism that has been freed of democratic and cosmopolitan elements can fit nationalism like a well-made glove fits a beautiful hand. For Maurice, the problem is that socialism often led to internationalism, as its proponents were of egalitarians. But there was nothing wrong with workers' rights. Although it should be stated, Maurice never had any official economic policies. He just believed in whatever he received to benefit the French fatherland most from an integral nationalist perspective. Sorel was originally in favor of anarcho-syndicalism, even if he didn't identify as an anarchist, but later abandoned anarchism for integral nationalism, which of course involves both borders and a monarch, the opposite of an anarchic landscape. He had denounced Marxism in his book La Decomposition du Marxisme, where he further expressed his idealist views. Socialism as a whole was later abandoned by Sorel. His cynicalism had vanished, sadly devolving to the generic national corporatism espoused by most fascists. This was glaringly a kind of capitalism, a very dishonest brand. As for Maurice Bars, he supported protectionism for a long time, believing in the excellence of native goods over foreign properties, clearly due to the affection he held for France. It's claimed he coined the term National Socialism in reference to economics involving heavy emphasis on the native working class as opposed to a universal working people. However, even if this is true, it bears no relation to what National Socialism arrived to be known as. His nationalism was civic nationalism, anyway, so he had no admiration for racism, let alone racism mixed in with pseudo-scientism. To my knowledge, Bars never commented his opinions on any mode of production, so claiming he's a capitalist or socialist is probably incorrect. These three French thinkers were the main inspirations for Giovanni Gentile, Benito Mussolini, and the fascist intellectuals of Italy who often accompanied the two. When he arrived at education, what was taught to the children of Italy by the idealist state the ideas of Maurice, Bars, and Sorel were incorporated by the administrators of public schooling. 
so that the children could develop a sense of spiritual nationalism too. For more on this topic, to learn about these thinkers, there's this perfect book that I own which details the thoughts of all Shri and how they communicate with one another, their history and political evolution. Shri Against the Third Republic, Sorel Bars and Marie's by Michael Curtis. If you find this stuff interesting, I suggest you give this brilliant publication a read. It's certainly a breath of fresh air, considering that everyone, almost all the time, is wrong about everything.